CXO interview series, The Journey to Digital First, a quarterly series where we bring forward like-minded leaders to share their experiences as they progress through their continuous digital first journey. I'm Allison Breeding, Aptio's EVP of Marketing, and I'm so excited to be here today with Rhonda Gass, the CIO from Stanley Black & Decker. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. Okay. So Rhonda, you've been at Stanley Black & Decker coming on eight years. Can you provide us with a high-level overview of your current role and responsibilities within your organization? Sure. i uh, be happy to um, talk to you about what the role entails, but Maybe it'd be helpful to outline how we think about the technology landscape at Stanley Black & Decker first. Um, you know, technology and more specifically digital technology permeates everything we do, not only in traditional IT, which we talk about at Stanley Black & Decker as business technology or BT, but also in our commercial offerings, the digital products and services we sell to our customers. We refer to those as CT. And then technology also encompasses our efforts on the manufacturing floor to connect and automate our machines. And we, you know, commonly call that OT or operations technology. So we think about it in those three distinct buckets. And it's important because our organizations, our maturity levels, and our focus areas differ quite a bit. So as the global CIO, I lead the technology strategy, delivery, and technology operations for business technology. And then I also have the added responsibility of digital risk management and cybersecurity, those things for all areas of technology across the company. And if I and my team do our jobs well, we like to say we're equipping our businesses with the digital data and collaboration capabilities that they need to win and grow in this global marketplace. Can you speak to your digital transformation agenda with your organization and any key initiatives? Fantastic question. Um, well, first, you know, after centralizing the IT function within the company and then driving capability and cost leverage, which was that that was job number one. We've since aligned the IT organization to the strategic imperatives of the company. Um, and our foundational pillars are, are three simple things. They, well, they sound simple. Performance, innovation and responsibility. So in the performance area for the IT organization, it's all about driving sustained value realization. So I think of this as optimizing the how of IT. We're pursuing strategic technology partnerships for more effective IT service delivery. And of course, pursuing things like TBM or technology business management, which allows our stakeholders to make informed value-based digital technology investment decisions with insights about their consumption and total cost of ownership. In the second pillar of responsibility, we, we link our focus there uh, to digital risk management. And our efforts there are to ensure that all of that digital technology I talked about, whether it be BT, CT, or OT, is cyber secure. Um, and then that brings me to the innovation pillar, um, where we're enabling the growth and transformation agenda of the company. Um, and we're doing that by delivering a digital platform ecosystem. And I like to say with data at the center and connectivity all around. Um, it's all about democratizing that technology and data, and it, it's really our North, North Star. You know, everyone needs a North Star because no longer is technology really the domain of the traditional IT organization only, um, but we have a critical role to play in ensuring that that technology is done right, that it's secure and private, as well as ensuring that leverage and optimization of the assets are taking place. It's a complex problem, and IT has to broker integrate and consult in the best way to drive this value and enable innovation. Talk to me a little bit about why and when you put TBM in place from a financial management perspective. Absolutely. It all ties back to that performance pillar that I, I talked to you a little bit about. You know, financial management in IT was traditionally done using a standard set of, you know, FP&A or financial planning and accounting tools, which was really chart of accounts based. And it provided limited insight to things like cost of service, uh, cost of a project, what are your consumption levers? So IT had built out some rudimentary tools, um, mostly in spreadsheets, to kind of track our assets and our license costs. We've put most of that now in ServiceNow. Um, we also use things like Microsoft Project, um, but we've added some more sophisticated tools like Clarity for portfolio management. And all of these things feed our Aptio solution for TBM. Um, it's really important to, to us that we have TBM so that we can move from this defensive cost center and you know, justify your value position um, to this really 
offensive um, on the, you know, on your um, front foot with insight driven positions, um, which really helps the entire organization optimize their value realization. So that's why we adopted TBM. Great. So let's talk about your cloud journey. Um, would love to hear kind of where, where were you at in your cloud adoption? And then what percentage of workloads were in the cloud and where are they now? So kind of a, when you got there versus where, where you are today. Yeah, so our cloud journey. Uh, we, we like to say we're cloud first, um, but we do allow our applications to choose the best hosting solution for their specific workload. You know, more often than not these days and over my tenure here in the last eight years, the preferred hosting location is a cloud platform or um, even better, a software as a service platform. Uh, but given our history, we still have a lot of legacy and, and a lot of on-prem in our mix. Um, we've successfully exited company owned data centers and that was a huge plus um, during my, uh, my tenure. Um, my mantra is friends don't let friends own and operate data centers. There's just, there's just too many other things for us to get focused on. But I can certainly say there's a lot more for us to do to get the legacy converted to cloud, but it's, it's certainly our goal. So what is your journey from projects to products been? Um, and kind of around agile portfolio management, what has that journey been like for you? What outcomes are you trying yeah. for? Sure. Sure. On the topic of projects to products, um, I would say we have a strong desire and we have aspirations there, but we don't yet have all the underpinnings in place to run full agile at scale. And of course, I don't just mean in the IT organization, but also throughout our businesses and functions. You know, while everyone loves the idea of agile and their definition is usually that you can go faster and, and spend less um, in order to get to that you know, value realization mode, but, um, and they can all use these terms for us, sprint, scrum, MVP, and, but there are many components that need to change in our business operation. So areas like our financial investment processes, which are currently based on an upfront ROI calculation, kind of hard to do in true agile at scale. Also, we have a accounting enforced freeze calendar that only allows software from the IT organization into production at very limited times throughout the year also not very conducive to an agile DevOps kind of setup. We also need to put product definitions and product owners in place with our businesses and functions. And, and those are just a, a few. Now I will say we're working on all of these things, particularly outside our systems of record. And we have a very healthy iterative build activity underway that has helped us along uh, this journey path. Now let's fast forward to 2020 when COVID-19 hit forcing every company to become digital first, whether they were ready to or not. How did COVID-19 impact your company and how did it change your strategy and your priorities? Uh, when COVID-19 hit, uh, the company's priorities were really focused on three things. First and foremost, it was the health and safety of our 60,000 employees around the world. And half of those employees were considered essential workers in our uh, distribution and manufacturing facilities. So hugely, hugely important. The second one was really just operating and staying financially strong to serve our customers. And three, we wanted to help our communities um, mitigate the impact of the virus. And what we found during those first few months of the pandemic in IT were that the demand shifted to four key things. Again, ensuring the safety and security of our employees and our operations, but working from anywhere for our employees, servicing our customers from anywhere, and believe it or not, enabling rapid decision making around return on investment, because we were really dealing with as demand dropped off in those first couple of months, where do we where do we put our, our critical dollars and where can we free up dollars? Now, I liken these four things to really the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it was during these most volatile times that the needs of the organization were what I would describe as really basic, akin to food, shelter, and safety. And we weren't talking about self-actualization. Um, just a few months prior to that, you know, machine learning and AI were, was, was, you know, really the focus of the company, but we really got back to basics and the basic operational needs of the company. And in IT, we were prepared. You know, this North Star architecture and strategy that I talked about earlier was well underway before the pandemic. Um, and it positioned us pretty well then, and it's also positioned us well now that we're in, into the recovery phases. But 
We'd implemented some major building blocks, um, some things like global SD-WAN. So when the move to internet-based things like Zoom skyrocketed, our network was ready to perform. We had modernized telephony, and I'm sure you're probably saying, who, who cares about telephony these days? But when you think about call center personnel who need to work remotely, it was hugely important that we had already done that kind of um, underpinning work. Also things like VPN and VDI, we had done primarily to help enable some of the M&A activity that we've done. You heard we're pretty acquisitive, but we've gotten all those foundational things done and it prepared us well when, when this crisis hit. So I think that, that that's very helpful for my next question, which is really, it sounds like um, some of these challenges um, really brought change for the better for your, for your company, right? Um, it, it seems like, you know, how, uh, do you think any of these challenges and the fixes to these challenges rather are here to stay? Well, certainly um, you're absolutely right. You know, working from anywhere and servicing our customers from anywhere is here to stay. Um, so not only have we been effective in these new virtual and hybrid working styles, but we're also able to leverage talent almost immediately without the personal impact of, say, major relocations. Um, further, uh, I think we learned, and, and I know it's here to stay, is that the change management barrier to technology adoption, while not completely broken down, it is greatly improved. You know, out of need, again, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, the organization was much more accepting of new ways of working because they had to. Um, so new technology and tools were quickly adopted. We didn't have to push them. And you know, similarly, our customers have flocked to e-commerce, and we expect that to continue as well. All right. So let's think. Let's uh, let's talk about kind of the next chapter. Um, as you think about the future of your organization um, now that we're in 2021 um, and beyond, what are your strategic priorities now? Yeah, great. We're all looking forward to 2021, right? And and what it, and the promise that it brings. And for the IT organization, you know, we're staying the course um, on our three pillar strategic plan: performance, innovation, responsibility. Um, but some of the tactics will change, of course. But we believe we're positioned to continue to enable the organization for success. Now, in the company, we see four key acceleration areas for our company. Number one, no surprise, e-commerce. As I mentioned earlier, now more than ever, our customers want to explore, investigate, and purchase online. And we'll continue to focus there to make that experience the best it can be. Um, the other area, probably no surprise, is this do-it-yourself and outdoor space, which is right in our wheelhouse, has taken on a new vigor during COVID and, and, and even as we come out of, of this pandemic. And now that we're spending more time in and around our homes, those DIY and outdoor projects are really getting much more focus, and we expect that to continue as well. Um, in our security segments that I talked about, our safety and health solutions, um, things like automatic doors. I mean, who wants to touch a door anymore? N not me. Um, and contact tracing. All of these things are certainly seeing expanded opportunities. Um, last but not least, we have strong expertise in manufacturing and industry 4.0 that we've been deploying internally for quite some time. And we're also pursuing some commercial opportunities to help others with these solutions as well. Um, now that we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel here in 2021. Great, lots of, lots of great innovation coming our way. Um, what challenges do you feel like you're currently facing now, right? So you've got, you've got you know, quite a long list of priorities and innovations that you want to um, attack in 2021. What's, what's keeping you up at night? I sleep really well. I always joke about that, but um, for challenges, I'd have to call out the never ending needs in talent acquisition, uh, both direct and indirect. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I have an amazing and talented team and a wonderful group of technology partners but there is never enough capacity and the technology landscape is changing so rapidly that the skill sets that we need are almost indeterminate at times. So figuring out when to make versus buy, hire versus leverage um, is challenging to say the least. Um, the next area I'd call out is digital risk management and cybersecurity um, with um, laws and regulations in place, as well as bad actors becoming more vigilant, um, uh, throw in there that everyone in the company believes they're a technologist and can make technology purchasing decisions. 
you know, this is an area of constant focus and always running to keep up and hopefully stay ahead in that area. Those are the two main ones I'd call out. What impact do you see new delivery models like cloud and agile uh, have on, on all of the transformations that, that, you're, that you're talking about making? Sure. Well, cloud and agile are enabling more than just the IT department to make impactful technology decisions. You know, much of that has been democratized. And that's why our North Star architecture is, is so important, keeping data and connectivity at the center, but the ability to flex and change rapidly at the point of impact for the business and by the business is definitely the goal. Now, I recognize that this is easier said than done. But as you know, cloud technologies and agile methodologies are key um, to making this a reality. So from your perspective, what key things should CIOs be thinking about between you know, now and the next two years? As soon as I name these, I'm probably gonna regret it because something, something um, exciting will have been missed, but it, it is a great question. And I think about it in terms of our strategy, again, back to performance, I'd say TBM, Get on your front foot by providing insights in the technology levers, the consumption, the value drivers. Are we investing where we thought? Are we seeing the return? In a nutshell, are we realizing value? So I, I would call that one out. In the innovation space, I, I think I've highlighted this over and over again, but for us, it's all about the data, which can enable and empower users to achieve great outcomes. So innovation equal data outcomes. And then responsibility, we talked about this one, but cybersecurity. If you haven't already, understand it, invest in it, stay vigilant. If you think you're okay, then you're already behind. Excellent recommendations. Are there any members of the C-suite that have become your allies or increased their involvement with your organization as you embark on your digital first journey? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, let's see, when I, when I think about um, responsibility in that theme. Our chief counsel, um, our um, head of communications, the CEO for that matter, and, and including the board are deeply engaged in risk management and specifically technology risk management. So again, as technology permeates everything, there's a keen interest from, from that community. When I think about innovation, um, our business unit presidents, you know, I um, did overview some of those business units for you, uh, quite diverse, but they are all really progressive leaders and our uh, understanding of the role of technology um, to enable new business models. And they're wanting to partner um, on specific use cases. So, so that's great. And I can't leave this one out in the performance category, the CFO. Yep, he's there, but not just to drive cost out. Uh, but equally ready to have that ROI discussion and talk about the role technology spin has in making all of the strategies of the company come to fruition. So those are the constituencies I'd call out. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty broad swath of folks that are, are, are my friends. That's great though. That's just, that, that's a, a great testament to, you know, the role you play. So um, kudos to you on that. Now let's switch gears a little bit and have some fun questions. Um, so if you were at a beach right now, which sounds fantastic to me, um, what book would you be reading? I can guarantee you would have nothing to do with current events and politics. Um, I would definitely stay away from that. We're inundated with it. I really like to read um, some kind of murder mystery. I know that sounds terrible, but um, I, I like to try and figure out who done it before they reveal it. Um, and many times I get it right, but there are a lot of times I get it wrong as well, but I find those a, a lot of fun. Great. What movie are you currently, or TV show, are you currently mm. watching? First, I really must claim that I think I've seen everything and I'm now into foreign films. It doesn't matter if I have to pay very close attention and read the text, but I will tell you what I found during COVID that I had no idea I would enjoy so much and it was Shit's Creek. Um, it took me a little while to get into it, but then when it was over, I felt like my, I'd lost my best friend. So it was, it was a very um, um, very welcome experience with, with that. I might have cried at the end. <laughs> it's over, yeah. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really great um, engagement um, and I uh, just really appreciate your time. Thank you, it's been a lot of fun.